In this series, lowimpact.org talks with people working to build a mutually owned, democratic, decentralised economy that builds community and doesn't destroy nature. We want to increase collaboration to bring about system change. Find links to the sites mentioned in the videos in the description below. Join the conversation by liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel. Today I'm talking with Ted Rao of Sociocracy for All. Hello, Ted. Hello, Dan. I want to interview you to produce an introduction to sociocracy for lowimpact.org and also to promote the concept of sociocracy and your organisation. Um, I, I work with two cooperative non-hierarchical groups, uh, the Credit Commons Society and Low Impact, and we're looking into sociocratic decision making. Um, and I know there's a lot more detailed information on your site, which I'll which I'll link to. Uh, but this is just a, an introduction to inspire people to find out more. So um, first of all, what is it? So so first, uh, what's it for? What what problem does it solve? Yes, so so, so I guess it's a governance system, which doesn't sound so super exciting for too many at first. Um, I understand governance as kind of the piece that connects the people and the project that we want to do. So here's a simple example. If you have a project that you want to do with 100 people or even 50 people, um, and you just put them all in one room and say, let's do it, right? Probably not much is gonna happen, right? Because what you need is you kind of need the wiring, the plumbing, the, the, the structures and the procedures and so on between the people to make it all happen, right? So that's what gov governance is. And there are two parts to it. One is the part that is um, who decides what and who does what. And the other one is how do we decide? Yeah. And those two things is what sociocracy answers. So it's a way to decide who decides what. And it's a way to decide once you've decided that so that everything can be decided and can ultimately be done. So that's okay. a high level overview. Yeah. And, and how does it work? What's the basic idea? Yes. So the basic idea is to create small groups so that we can always have good conversations and really deep and meaningful conversations and really take in the feedback that we hear from all over the organization and what we learn. So we basically chunk, chunk everything that needs to be decided um, into, into pieces and then distributed into what we call circles, so into teams. So for example, in sort of the mid-sized organization, you might have 20 circles. They each have a clear area of decision-making so that everything has a box where it can be decided. And ideally those um, circles would be between four and six or seven people right. so that you can have small groups so they can really listen to each other. Okay. And that way you, um, have a place where everything can be decided and you have those groups that are empowered to make decisions so that then the people really are in charge and ideally the people who for example work in a circle let's say in a membership circle would be the people who also do the work in that membership circle for example welcome new members and inform them and onboard them or something like that so that you have the people who do the work also be the people who make the decisions in that area so that it goes together instead of like in a, in a hierarchical system right? right where some people do things and some people decide things yeah and in this case it's put together yeah okay and what's the process so, well, there's several processes that come with it. You might be referring to the decision-making process. So the yes. decision-making process is by consent, um, which means it's really the different levels of details to look at it. So um, the basic principle is that a decision passes or proposal passes if nobody in the decision-making group, so nobody in the circle, has an objection. Which means, in practice, that means somebody in the team, let's say in that membership circle, has a proposal about like, hey, let's do, I don't know, free info sessions every month so people can find our organization. And then everybody in membership circle sees the proposal and has a chance to ask questions about the proposal and then to give a reaction to the proposal. And then they ask, well, do you consent or do you object? And if they consent, that means they say, yeah, there's nothing wrong with the proposal. It's not going to harm us. Right, and if okay. they object, they okay. show how it harms. 
Okay, so I, I used to live at uh, I used to live in a, an intentional community, and there were fifteen members, and we had a weekly meeting, and uh, we used consensus. So it, it wasn't just consent; it was more than that. It was that everybody had to positively agree, <laughs> mm -hmm. otherwise uh, it didn't happen, and the status quo maintained. But this is slight, slightly different, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, because you don't have to actively agree. You don't have yeah. to say, yeah, this is the, the best idea. You only have to say, yeah, this, that's fine. You know, like you just have to be able to live with it. One of the slogans in sociocracy is safe, uh, good enough for now, safe enough to try. So you don't have to throw your hands in the air and say, yeah, that's the best proposal on earth. Because the assumption is, well, there's several assumptions here. One is that... Um, whether or not somebody loves it or some somebody just says this is going to work this is you know this is going to be fine might not be such a big difference in practice yeah the other one is that ultimately none of us really know what's going to happen so we're all just making guesses into the future and yes our opinions are some indicator for that but the best indicator is to go do something and try it out because then you'll know whether it works yeah. so consent is aimed to lower the bar a little bit so that then it's easier to put something out so that then we can learn from that instead of always just staying in our head and in our hypothetical what would be the best plan yeah. without ever doing anything yeah sort of the, the 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 perfect is the enemy of the of the good exactly that <laughs> and that happens so much right so much okay um bit of history yes uh, sociocracy was put together um, by somebody called Gerard Edinburgh in the, in the Netherlands in the late 1970s. And he was drawing from his experience um, of having been as a child to a Quaker school. So he saw decision making there, which was consensus, right? Um, and he also was an engineer. So he studied cybernetics, which is where the feedback system came in. So just what I just said, right, about we learn from feedback. So it's about trying things out and learning what we learn from that. And then the third piece is natural systems. So just um, his fascination with how natural systems build with all the nesting and so on. Mm -hmm. That's a piece I haven't talked so much about, but the idea is that all the circles nest so that there's always kind of a part of relationship. Let's say, you know, marketing has a sub-circle that is social media and social media has a sub-circle that is yeah. Twitter. So that we always have a place where something belongs, just like in nature, a yeah. leaf is part of a branch, is part of a tree, is part of a forest, and so on. Recursive, yeah. So yeah, and he put that together based on all the different sources and tried it out in his own company. Um, and then refined it there. And that's really the key principles and processes that we still use. Of course, every person that learns it kind of makes it their own, right? With their own little like changes and flavors and so on. But that really is what it is. So and um what different kinds of sociocracy are there? Are there different sort of kinds for different kinds of organizations or different circumstances? Well, it always gets adapted in practice. Um, there are different overall flavors because um, of how people kind of um, name and put out their own version. Um, the, the version of um, Jared Enberg is basically called the Sociocratic Circle Method. That's kind of the official name for it. Um, and that has a defined set of principles and rules and so on. Um, then there's sociocracy 3.0, which was an attempt to, or is an attempt to um, make it more suitable for businesses, especially in agile. And that has mostly to do with language. And also it's a slightly different pedagogical approach because- Did you, did you say did you say 3.0? Yes. What happened to 2.0? There is none. They oh, just right, okay. directly to 3.0. Yeah, that's, I guess the, the story I asked the the, um, James Priest uh, about the story and his intention actually I don't know why it was three but the intention overall was to show the legacy of sociocracy because they wanted to to honor that legacy but really also show that they were mm, seeing it as something new because of that connection to agile and as I said the pedagogical approach to um, take sociocracy and and put it into different patterns, which I have a mixed feelings about or mixed experiences with too. But that's the idea that everybody can just kind of mix and match all the different pieces. Right. Um, 
and then some of the of the um, spin-offs that is kind of most different, I would say, is Holacracy, which is used a lot in for profits, um, and that's. I've heard about this. Um, yeah. I don't know much about it though. Could you could you just explain a bit the difference between Holacracy and and sociocracy? Uh, it really depends a little bit on the practice, but. Overall, and so it's a, it's going to be an, a simplification and oversimplification what I say, but with what, with links with links to more information that I can add. Into sure, the, sure, yes, that's a, yes, that's good. So overall, holacracy puts more emphasis on roles and then on circles, while sociocracy puts slightly more emphasis on circles than roles. So that means in practice that in sociocracy things are more decided by a collective, at least policy decisions like the general guidelines. While in holacracy, we put more emphasis on individual roles where a lot of authority can be clustered. So it's a little bit right. more individualistic right. and a little bit more, more authority kind of distribute onto people, which, you know, one can do in sociocracy too. You can define operational roles in sociocracy too as, as much as you want to. Mm -hmm. um, but holacracy really builds on that. And another piece is that it's stricter in the decision making. So one example is that one has to um, basically there's several set, like there's a filter mechanism for your objections. So you in sociocracy, it's kind of one has more leeway to explain an objection um, in whatever way you want. In holacracy, you kind of have to match a pattern, and only then will your objection be heard. Right. So yeah, do you, do you have? I mean, I, I I can talk to you later, and I can collect some more links to holacracy yes. and the differences between holacracy and sociocracy, and also a bit more information on the mix and match, how people can take different aspects and and tailor them for their circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um, how widespread is the use of sociocracy? How much has it taken off? How how big has it got? Yeah, the funny thing is about sociocracy is that it's in free and open system, right? So nobody has to tell anybody if they use sociocracy or right. license okay, it yeah. or whatever. It's just like people just do it, do parts of it, do it's something they call sociocracy. It's just out there, which I love because that's exactly yeah. what I want and we contributed yeah. to that quite a bit, actually. Um, so it's a, it has been used for many years now in intentional communities, as you were saying, too. Um, like my own intentional community where I live has been using it for nine years now. You live in uh, an intentional community? Yes, uh, yes. Which one? Um, in, in Amherst, uh, Piney Valley Co-housing. It's, oh, right. it's 32 houses, so about 80 people. Um, could, you say, could you say it again? Piney Valley Co-housing. Pine? Pioneer. Pioneer Valley Co-housing, yeah, okay. And uh, so, yeah, intentional communities are big, and there are dozens of intention. Now, actually, if you look on the um, on the website, the Foundation for Intention Community, um, I think there's I don't remember maybe two hundred or so intentional communities self-identify as sociocratic. It doesn't right, always okay. mean that they use sociocracy the way I describe it, but you know, it's really clearly out there, and we have many groups that form that to do their homework and say, okay, we want to form an intentional community and apparently sociocracy is the way to go. So we want to learn it. So you can really tell intentional community, it's it's taken off, it's not going away again. Right, okay. Then in other in other sectors, it's kind of up and coming, like in worker co-ops, um, it's clearly known, it's clearly on the map, but it yeah. still needs some time to kind of really make yeah. its way there's there. Lo there's lots of information about sociocracy on um, the Co-ops UK website. Great, yes. And then there is um, schools, nonprofits, and of course, for profits, where it's still lagging behind a little bit, but coming. So we notice that there's just always an increasing demand um, and interest for sociocracy. So it's especially in the last five years, it has really increased a lot. Um, what's your role in sociocracy for all, by the way? I am one of the co-founders. I've co-founded with my colleague, Jerry Koch Gonzalez. And... Um, I am currently, and my role is for another year or so, actually nine months, then we will have selection process again, uh, the leader of the general circle. So when all the circles come together, kind of all the nesting, kind of the tree trunk where everything comes yeah. together, that's the general circle. And I was selected by the general circle as the leader of the general circle. So I basically am the counterpart of the executive director because we're nonprofit. Um, so that's that's my role in it. 
Uh, but does that mean your voice has more weight in the uh, in the main in the center circle? <laughs> um, well, there's two things about that. I guess there is the um, the structural power. Um, so my voice doesn't have a more power in the general circle because we make decisions by consent. Yeah. So um, not that I do, of course, since I work full time, I have a lot of um, yeah, I contribute a lot. So I also know a lot of the things that happen. So I'm one of the people that can connect loose ends that haven't found each other, you know, neural endings that haven't found each other yet and so on. And yes, there's some power in that because there's some power in doing things, right? Yeah. Um, so that I certainly have. The other piece is that I have very mixed feelings about, honestly, is because I've been around so long and, and know so much about sociocracy and have so much experience, and many of my colleagues are younger and haven't haven't um, haven't been around so long. Um, you know, they do look up to me, and mm -hmm. that's that's a little tricky. That's also a reason yeah, why I'm starting. You look mm -hmm. quite young. That's probably yes. my age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's also something I'm trying to get used to. Of like, wait, there are people who look at me as somebody's <laughs> old and experienced. That can't quite be. That just happened in the last few years. Yeah. I don't know. It happens. It's awkward. <laughs> it's awkward. Yeah, but it's it's important for us. And we've started the conversation to start about start talking about succession and how's that, you know, like just because I don't want to just sit on that role, you know, till I retire. That's not my plan because I want other people to to step up and 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 have have experience. So well we're starting to talk about how that will be. Yeah, yeah, yeah.